I just have a couple of verses that I want to share with you this morning and it's a very well known portion and it's one of my favourites actually and it's found in, you won't even have to look it up this morning, it's Hebrews chapter 12 and it's verses 1 to 2 and it says there, therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Never really studied this verse very much until now. And, you know, in this chapter of Hebrews, it mentions the great cloud of witnesses. But in the previous chapter, it lists some of those great cloud of witnesses. Men and women, you can name them. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and of course, not forgetting Sarah. These verses bring us so much encouragement to continue in this race that we've all entered into. Do you know that the day you were born, you entered this race, whether you liked it or not, you entered this race. And since then, since that day, you have been traveling along the race that has been set before you. Even before you were born, the race had already been tracked out for you. The race, it has, the race has been set out the day it started and the day it will end. We are in the race and we're called to run the race with yeah. endurance. Not so sure if I like that word endurance. But that's what God's word says. Just like those great people of faith who ran before us, we're called to run this race with endurance. We're all in the race, but it is God that sets out our individual tracks with endurance. You see, your track might be, not be the same as my track, but God has set that track out for you. We are to run with endurance. Do you know, this reminds us that the race we run will not be easy at times. Let's face it. Some of us had tracks laid out for us that have been more difficult than others. Yet when we look back at these great men and women of faith, we must be encouraged to keep going. Albeit life on the track can have its blessings along the way. And we are, should be really thankful that, for that. Even though sometimes they're just little brief blessings. I'm thinking of the great marathon runners who run for miles and miles and only they stop for refreshments at the pit stops along the way. You see, God gives us little pit stops, little blessings along the way, and I am so thankful for that. We are encouraged also to lay aside every sin, every weight that, as the writer says, so easily, it so easily ensnares us, so easily trips us up, Another version says, so easily entangles us. It's so easy to get caught up in the things that would take us down tracks that God hasn't marked out for us. Don't go there. I love the way the writer says in yet another translation, throw off every weight that so easily besets us. I have a little granddaughter, I have a little grandson. And they are blessings. They're little pit stops along the way. But my little granddaughter, when she doesn't want her drink that I've set out for her, she just throws it away. She just throws it down. She flings it down with all the energy that she has. And that's what we've got to do with the sin that easily besets us. Throw it off. Throw it off. 
And then we'll feel much better. Mind you, I don't encourage that. Throw things down. <laughs> but I thought it was a good example. So it's not something that I encourage her to do, but in this instance, the writer of the Hebrews tells us, yes, go ahead, throw off every weight, every sin that besets you. How can we keep on running this race with such endurance? The answer is to keep looking to Jesus, the author of our faith. Fix our eyes on him who endured more than we could ever face and to an even greater degree. He suffered so much for you and for I. Whatever we face or whatever we are facing, we can take great comfort that Jesus himself has faced even greater. He's been there. He knows He's tracked it all out for you. Remember what happened to Peter when he took his eyes off Jesus when walking on the water. But also remember what happened when Peter cried out. Note that the author quickly changes from great examples of faithful witnesses of the past to whom we glance to the perfect example. You see, Jesus was our perfect example, the one who we can fix our eyes on and we can run. Jesus is our example. We must keep our eyes on Jesus if we are to finish the race. And when we do finish, because one day the race will finish, we don't know when, but we must, we will receive our heavenly prize, the prize of the high heavenly joy. So my advice, or not my advice, but God's word tells us, keep your eyes on him today. Not just today, but for the duration of that race that God himself has marked out for you. May God bless you. And don't forget the pit stops along the way. Amen. Let's turn to God's word together. Uh, I want to read you a post you all know. And I, I do think as, a, as I started my sessions in the new year around the suddenlies, I'm back to a piece of scripture I spoke on earlier on in the year about suddenlies. And it's one of the most important suddenlies in human history. But we're going to start before we come to the main text with a few verses from Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read from... Uh, verse 4. On one occasion, while they were eating with them, he gave them this command Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then let's go over into chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered 
together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthens, Medes, Ammonites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius in Asia, Phyria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and convert to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God <coughs> in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Somehow, however, made fun of them and said, they have heard too much, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. In the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. <coughs> I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you and through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, Amen. freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at the right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead and you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and will fill me with joy and in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I call, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on the thrones. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, and he was abandoned to the realm of the dead. Nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he was received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstools. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to the Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will be received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God calls. There were many words were warned them and pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message and were baptized were about 3,000 were added that number on that day. And we'll finish there. Amen. Why am I reading this? <clears throat> we're only a, a few weeks away from Pentecost Sunday. Now, Pentecost Sunday, we're not going to be recording the service here. We're going to be allowing the Holy Spirit to move in the house. 
Because this is one of the most significant events in the church's history. But there's some lessons for us to learn from this. First thing is this. Jesus tells them at the beginning, and that's why we read chapter 1. I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait on the promise of, that was promised to you of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So they go to Jerusalem and they're waiting. Now, we know from the records there was about 120 of them in this small room waiting on God, praying and seeking God. How long did they wait for? Anybody, any ideas? Was it one day? Two days? Three days? Four days? By day four, most of us would be given up. Right? They were waiting 10 days before the events of Pentecost. They went as the Lord had told them to wait. Now, I, I know for us, as, as you know, if we're waiting on a bus, you ever stand in the train station or the bus station? Do you ever see people waiting on the bus or the train? They're going and they're looking. <laughs> When's it coming? When's it going to get there? When's this going to happen? God's told them they're going to be blessed. They know what's coming. They know the Holy Spirit, but they're having to wait. And they wait for 10 days before it actually happens. Now this tells me something about these people's faith. First of all, they obeyed Jesus. They went to Jerusalem and they waited. Blessing always comes in obedience to the Lord. Always comes in obedience to the Lord. Second thing is, they believed that the Lord was going to do what he said he was going to do, and they weren't giving up on it. Philippians says, we press in, we persevere. Here we see the disciples persevering, waiting in the upper room. Day one, nothing happens. Day two, nothing happens. Day three, nothing. But they keep waiting. They keep obeying. They keep holding on to what God has for them. And then eventually, on day 10, there's a suddenly a sound. Hallelujah. For the suddenlies of God. Suddenly there's a sound. Like a mighty rushing wind that comes in. And tongues that appear like flames and land in each one of them. And they start speaking in new tongues. Hallelujah. I can guarantee you. And I'm pretty sure that most of them didn't know exactly what was going to happen when God came. They knew God was going to do it. They knew God was going to pour out. But what was he going to do? How was it going to manifest? I'm pretty sure most of them didn't know that. You see, God tells us he's going to do things, but he does them his way. We can't even start to comprehend sometimes what God's going to do. You see it in scripture. When Jesus starts to tell the disciples that he's going to go to, to, to be crucified, and he's going to die, and he's going to be raised up, Three days later, what's the first words that comes out of their mouth? Think of what Peter says. Oh no, Lord, that can't be so. Because it didn't fit with Peter's thinking. Because he didn't want his Lord to suffer. But Jesus knew he had to suffer to pay the price for my sin and your sin. So what God did didn't fit. With the thinking of man. And when we come to this, this event in the book of Acts. I mean I'm pretty sure. They were like what on earth is going on here? Start speaking in new languages. That, that fast language course. Wow. There's never been anybody learning new languages quick. In a few moments. They start speaking in foreign languages. And not one but Many. I mean, you've seen the list that was there. Parthians, Medes, all these different languages. Cretans, Arabs. They were speaking and they were declaring the wonders of God. You see, this is how God does things. He just changes things like that. Even though we know what's going to happen. You know, there's another sudden event going to happen that we know of. But we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. And it's interesting because... Who likes to know things? Come on. Do you know, recently, was it, was it last? A couple of years ago, I, I remember uh, your woman, Christine Blake, or Christine Lampard, as she is now, bringing Adrian Childs to visit Northern Ireland. And 
they had a conversation about how friendly we are here. And then there was something that was noted. They're friendly because they're so nosy. <laughs> they want to know. That was, uh, yeah, that's, that's about right. But, you know, people want to know. Where are you from? Who your granda was? Who your granny was? Who your mummy was? Who your daddy was? What part? You know, they want to know. There's a nosiness. And, you know, it's a human factor. We want to know. When Jesus told the disciples to go and wait, they started to ask him. We read it in Acts chapter 1. Well, what's going to happen? What's going to go on here? And he goes, it's not for you to know. It's the Father's day decision. See, that's faith. That's faith. God reveals as well line upon line, precept upon precept. He gives you insights into where he wants you to go. He's got blessings for your life. I can tell you now that God wants to bless each one of you, but he won't give you the complete blueprint there and then because that's not walking of faith and trust and relationship. You give someone the whole plan, they go off and try to do it themselves. And that often doesn't work. We have to be in step with God. And so God says, Jesus said to them, just go and wait. God will show up. And boy, does he show up. Suddenly he shows up. And the whole house is shaken. Wow. Wouldn't it be good that on Pentecost Sunday morning when we come here to let the Holy Spirit, the whole house is shaken? Oh, come on. Don't get excited about it. I tell you, it'll be, and God does the shaking, it's exciting. Because God did things here that was remarkable in this meeting. They were in the upper room and the Holy Spirit turns up and there's an anointing upon them and they all start to speak in new tongues and they burst out of, the, out of the room into the streets. People come around them going, wow, what's going on here? I'm hearing them in my language. I'm, I'm, it's, it's amazing. Of course, you always get the cynics, don't you? You always get the people who doubt. Ah, oh, no, they're drunk. That, that's, you know, I remember, I remember when I was a young, uh, young nurse, uh, I was working in, in the city hospital doing my training, and we had a, a bishop in from one of the denominations, I think he was Church of Ireland bishops, and he, he told me this wonderful story about when he was at seminary college, he says, they had to write an essay on this. He says, and one of his friends wrote the essay, and he said, you know, that it was only nine o'clock in the morning. And as a joke he wrote in the essay, they couldn't possibly be drunk for the pubs don't open till 11. <laughs> but Peter makes the point here, actually, he's actually quoting Peter. Peter says, they couldn't be drunk, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. They weren't drunk. This was the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit moving upon them. It's amazing what God has done here. Suddenly, people are, God moves in their lives. Suddenly, these people are endued with power and they break out into the street and people go, wow, what's that? And then there's another very spectacular thing happens here. You see, Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1, when the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to become my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's what he says here, isn't that right? That's what he said. Well, here we come into Acts 2, and this is breaking out onto the street, and people start saying they're drunk, and Peter gets up and he goes, No, 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 no. Listen to me, all you Jews. All my brothers and sisters, listen to me. These people are not drunk. And then he starts to preach. This is the same Peter that was frightened of his own shadow when Christ was getting crucified. This is the same Peter who went the other direction and run away and denied Jesus. All of a sudden, he's got the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And with the boldness and the authority and the anointing of God's presence, he preaches. Wow. This is what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does. It takes the timid person and enables him. It takes those that feel they can't and makes you into one who can't. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The anointing of the Holy Spirit enables you to do things that is beyond your human capacity. Amen. Oh, pastor, prove that. 
Uh, these people were speaking their languages. They were all Galileans. They weren't educated. They didn't go to grammar schools or, or universities to learn the language. And in an anointing of the Holy Spirit, the next minute they're speaking into different nations' lives. Is that not the miraculous power of God? You see, this is what God does. When he suddenly moves in our lives, he brings power and revelation that changes everything. But we have to be willing to obey him. We have to be willing to wait on his timing. Oh, that's a problem for us. We're impatient. God just changed the situation for me right now because I can't cope with this no longer. Anybody been there? Yeah. Lord, I just, I want to, I want to string them up. Lord, please help. My patience is not, you know, we, we get like, do you know, I think, I thank God that Jesus didn't do that attitude for us. He didn't say, Lord, I've had enough of them. You know, you think back all the way through biblical history, we find people moaning about God. God, Why? Moses had us full of it in the wilderness. That, that always amazes me. A people that were fed every morning and every night, had their breakfast made for them, had their clothes renewed and they never wore out, and they still complained. Yeah, come on. It's the human psyche, isn't it? No matter how much we have, we like to complain. When it's raining, we give off about there's too much rain. When it's sunshine, we give off it's too hot. Come on. It's human nature. Yeah. Yet God reminds us we can be content in Him. Yes, Blessed in Him. When God breaks in suddenly, His contentment and His peace comes with it. His peace comes with it. Yeah. And so we find Peter here with this bold anointing starting to preach. And he says, this Jesus, this one who you crucified, who you get handed over to evil men, who was nailed to the cross and put into the grave because you, you didn't want anything to do with him, is the same one who has saved you, is the same one whose spirit has caused this anointing where you're hearing the glory of God being declared in your own language. And suddenly something happens. There's another suddenly a God here. Because we always think about this story, we think about the suddenly of the wind coming and the Holy Spirit coming upon people. But there was another suddenly that happened here. It says that their hearts were cut when Peter spoke the words. Amen. You see, the word of God divides between bone and mara and sinew. The word of God cuts right into the situation. And as Peter starts preaching, the realization that, that they had crucified the Messiah was suddenly dawning on the hearts of these men and women who were listening. Now, I don't know, because I, I don't know who was there and who wasn't there, but this is only 50 days after, Pente uh, after the Feast of Passover. So I, I, I would think that some of the people that were standing in this place in Jerusalem would be some of the same people that were standing a few weeks beforehand going, crucify him. The conviction of God's Spirit coming upon them. I know that if I had been one of those people, I would have found that hard to bear. To think that I had cried, crucify the Christ. It said they were cut. That's the language it uses. Cut to their heart by the words. And it goes, so what do we do? How do we do this? And Peter declares this wonderful, wonderful expression of God's love. If you call on the name of Jesus and believe, you shall be saved. Wow. Wow. One of the first gospel messages ever heard. And the response was 3,000 souls. He's the same Jesus today. 
the same Jesus today. When we call on his name, there's salvation. When we call on his name, there's peace that comes to our hearts. Because the things that I've done wrong in the past are covered in the blood of Christ. When we come round the table this morning to break bread, we're remembering that Jesus paid the price for all sin. Not some of your sins, all of your sins. All of our mistakes are covered in the blood of Christ. Amen. The enemy is very good at bringing before you all the things you've done wrong. It's funny how the nature of the world likes to bring up the things you've done wrong. Anybody have anybody tell you all the bad things you've done? Come on. Whether it's school or at home or workplace. Look at the pigs you, you made of that. Look at the way you did this. Look, it's the nature. But Jesus comes and says, you know, I know what you've done, but I love you and you're special because you're my child. I've numbered the hairs in your head. I've bottled the tears that you've cried. That's what the scripture tells us. And so he shed his blood for us. And Peter declares it here and 3,000 souls get saved. This sudden event in the book of Acts is the birth of the modern church. And it explodes with the power of the Holy Spirit. Do we not need a new anointing of his spirit this morning? Do we not need a new unfilling of his power? I know I love late Pastor Cawthorn preached a, a sermon here. You know sometimes people preach sermons and they stick with you. And he preached on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says that, that term being filled, he says it's an ongoing, be being filled. Constantly being filled with the presence of God. We need that. We need God just to break in suddenly in our lives again. But it starts with our obedience to his word and waiting on him. Has God promised you things? Come on. He hasn't forgotten them. He never forgets. He will accomplish that which he has set before you in his time. Not your time or mine, but his. Our job is to obey. Our job is to repent and believe. It changes our lives. When the Holy Spirit moves in, things happen. You know, I thank God this morning in the word of prophecy because this was a changing time for the church. The church changed. Jerusalem changed. He was a challenge. Everything's changed. Because some of these people that were, that were here in this, listening to Peter speaking, were waiting on the Messiah to come. Because yeah, And all of a sudden, they're challenged to realize the Messiah had come. He was already here. And they crucified him. And now he's raised from the dead. And the Holy Spirit's been poured out on all flesh. And I love, again, what Peter says in this. He says, to you, to your children, and to those afar off. Hallelujah. I love that because I was afar off. I was a few thousand years later. And not only that, I was a few continents different as well. I'm not in the Middle East, I'm in Europe. You know, here, God, afar off means you and me. That blessing of the Holy Spirit for us today. It's still relevant to us today. For God to break into our experiences and our lives and allow him to move. I want God to suddenly move in my life. But we have to deal with our perceptions. Because he's going to do it differently. And that might involve some changes we heard earlier from the Lord. That might change how we see things, how we do things. It might change even who we are in some cases. Because God's changing us to be more like Jesus. Isn't it wonderful that the Holy Spirit moves suddenly? Amen. Who wants a sudden move of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Yeah, Amen. praise God. I want it this morning, 
I want it a couple of weeks' time on Pentecost Sunday. I want the Holy Spirit just to move afresh amongst us. We need to be prepared for that. One of the things that they, they did here was they waited on God. So one of my reasons for preaching this again this morning and coming back to this text is in two weeks' time we come to Pentecost Sunday. I want you to be waiting from now. Lord, what are you going to do? Lord, what are we going to We need to be waiting on God for the Holy Spirit to move in the midst. It's not just a matter oh, let's just turn up and see what God does. We need to be actively seeking God as our brothers and sisters were. And let's allow the Holy Spirit to move. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the grace of Jesus upon us. We thank you that when our brothers and sisters all those years ago went to that upper room, they went in obedience and they waited on you. And they were not disappointed because when you poured out your spirit, Lord, Lord, life broke forth. Souls got saved. And Lord, this morning, Lord, even as we're in your presence, we're aware that you're still the same God for our unsaved loved ones, for those around, around us, Lord God, for those that are even listening online. Lord, that you're the same God who, if we call upon, will bring salvation into our lives. Lord, we repent of our sins and our mistakes. And we ask, Holy Spirit, you come afresh into our lives this morning. We ask, Lord, that you touch us afresh from your throne. Pour your Holy Spirit in, Lord God. Lord, anoint each one. We are expecting you to do something new in the house, in our lives. Lord, raise our expectations of you. Yes, Lord. But Lord, curb our imaginations that we might be open to your will and not ours. Yes that we may be open to do what the Father wants us to do, Lord. Lord, for that's where true blessing is. Lord, let us wait afresh on you even now. In Jesus' name. Amen.